All right, Titus chapter number one, Titus chapter number one, an uncomfortable passage for most folks to deal with. And the Apostle Paul, of all the things that he could say toward the, uh, the end of his life here, the Apostle Paul has given some instruction to Titus as he did in Timothy. Both of these epistles are written on how to deal with, uh, how to handle false teachers and false doctrine and useless arguments and uh, the qualifications for a, a bishop and so on and so forth. Both of them have things in common because he's instructing two younger preachers on what to do and how to continue after he's gone. It's unfortunate, ladies and gentlemen, but the Bible said that there must always be heresies among you that the man of God may be proven. Meaning that the way you find out if somebody is called to God to do what he's doing is, you find out if he sticks to the book. Now let me give you a word of caution if you're here, you're visiting, and you haven't been around in a while, uh, and you wonder what we believe. We don't believe that the pastor's the authority. We believe the book's the authority. We believe that the way you check to see if the pastor's telling you right is, is you check a King James Bible that's in your, park, in your uh, uh, lap. Now, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here. If I thought there was a multiplicity of, of, of uh, people that were in authority, then there'd be absolutely no point in us gathering here because your guess is as good as mine. The way God set the thing up was He gave you a single authority. Well, you know, what about the Valero? And what about the German Bible, the 1545? And what about this? And what about that and all that? You speak English. What about English? We're in America right now. Don't use that argument to duck out of the authority. All that stuff is to try to miss what the authority is. The authority is, and it should be preached authoritatively. The Bible says when Jesus preached, He said to him, they were amazed at His doctrine. You say, what is that? Absolutes. When Jesus preached it, there wasn't any question about the thing. It wasn't smoky and hard to understand. The Lord made it clear to understand. He gave, for the English-speaking people, He gave you a King James Bible, and it doesn't matter if you understand the whole thing, and if you did understand the whole thing, you'd either be dead in heaven or a fourth part of the Trinity. You're never going to understand the whole thing. Nobody can master that book. Uh, that's why the old preacher never called himself a scholar. He said a scholar is somebody that has mastered his subject. That's a guy that, in my opinion, had mastered it as well as anybody I've ever seen. But you know what he refused to say? Don't call me a scholar. I haven't mastered it. You say, why? Well, I'm still finding stuff at 94, 95 years of age that I never saw before. So the thing you want to recognize about it is, is that Paul is dogmatic about it and he doesn't go six or seven verses in Titus before he starts bringing up about the importance of truth. He does the same thing in Timothy. And what he says there is, is that there's always going to be people trying to derail you and mess you up. Some of you, you went to church all your life, nobody ever messed with you, ever said a word to you, and then you decided to come to a Bible-believing church, and all of a sudden they come out of the woodwork, and oh, well, now you know how Bible believers are, and you know I've heard about this about them, and, and they don't have anybody over them, and they don't have a, a, a main group that's up in Nashville or out in Rome or something like that, and uh, they believe in the autonomy of the local church, and that's a dangerous thing to be a part of. You're just being lazy, and you don't believe that. Nobody can tell you what to do anywhere else, but when it comes to church, all of a sudden everybody becomes an authority. So the Apostle Paul is laying out for you and I, importantly, or very importantly, that you need to understand that it is without the absence of controversy that when you come to doctrinal things, people are never messed with you before, but until it comes to that book, they're going to be questioning, what about this, what about that, yeah, I heard this, I heard that, and so on and so forth. When people get into personality conflicts, you know right off the bat, they don't have any basis from which to make their argument. Politicians are famous for that. They won't go and argue about the issues, they'll talk about what somebody did when they were in the 12th grade. You have to be careful about being around Bible believers that are that way. All they want to do is argue about somebody's character instead of make your point. Find out what the point is and make the point. Now Paul's going to give them some warnings. And he says the people that are causing the trouble in the church, he calls them gainsayers. Uh, that's uh, somebody that is trying to correct you, somebody trying to straighten you up, somebody that is trying to confuse you. And then he goes further to use some harsh words. Now, nowadays, what I'm about to say is considered hate speech because he labels individuals and he calls people names. See how uncomfortable you are? You say, well, no, wait a minute, you shouldn't do that. When it comes to the Bible... The Lord said, you're supposed to, and Paul said, Alexander the coppersmith had done much harm. The Lord reward him according to his deeds. Now here's what he does. Watch the name calling. He calls them unruly and vain talkers. 
He's calling them names. And then he goes on and he says to them, they're deceivers, they're liars, they're slow bellies, they're evil beasts, and then the last three probably define somebody that's lost, defiled, abominable, and disobedient. As a matter of fact, the passage we're going to get to over in Titus today, one of their own people, one of their own Christians, calls his own people names. Now you're being talked out of your Bible because you're being taught that it is wrong for you to say homosexuality is wrong. So if you talk about sodomites or queers, you shouldn't say that because you're labeling people. Same-sex marriage, you shouldn't say that. You're labeling people. No, I'm telling you, God doesn't think those things are okay. Amen. Marriage between a man and a woman. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Now, the schools are teaching different than that now, and they are under this public opinion and this auspices. Uh, you can't call people uh, certain things now because they say that's unkind and now it's hate speech. When it comes to the church labeling things so that you clearly understand who it is and what it is you're fighting is part of the biblical way of doing it. I showed you this on Sunday. The Lord says, woe unto you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, and he calls them snakes, he calls them vipers, he calls them foxes, he calls them names. That's Jesus calling people names. Now, I'm not saying you need to unnecessarily call somebody a name just to be mean and just to be mean-spirited, but you have to be able to put a label on something so that you can know what it is you're fighting, like criminal. You know, well, you shouldn't call them dirtbag. Okay, con. Can't call them con. What do you want to call them? There was a move years ago to take somebody when they got put in jail. You couldn't call them a prisoner. You called them a client. Okay, well, he's a stinking dirtbag going to jail for doing something he shouldn't have done. Well, I don't like being called a dirtbag. Then don't be going to jail. So now I guess whatever, you got a guy that's in the military, you can't call him a soldier anymore. What do you call him? Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not going to belittle the, or belabor the point, but let me go a little bit further and say this. Uh, the Bible teaches you very, very clearly that the unruly are, unruly are people that can't obey orders. They can't follow orders. They have a difficulty when it comes to things uh, involving uh, doing what God tells them to do. Take your Bible and come to 1 Timothy chapter number 1. The vain talkers is like vain, jangle, vain jangling. It's people that are just talking, uh, as my dad used to say, just to hear themselves talk. 1 Timothy chapter number 1, look if you will please in verse number 6. From which some having swerved, having turned aside unto what? Amen. Vain jangling is, is they're listening to somebody that is telling them things that they, don't, they ought not listen to. But they listen to it and then they got twisted up. Come to 2 Timothy. The Bible says, or Paul says to Titus, he says their mouths must be stopped. Now, the Bible teaches you clearly in 1 Corinthians 15, evil communications corrupt good manners. Is that true? That's communication of any kind. That's pictures, that's voices, that's any way that you communicate. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Somebody tries to get you in trouble by telling you to do something that you shouldn't do. Now, I'm fixing to put you in the box because evil communication can also look like it's right like false doctrine, like a guy that has on a suit and a tie and, and he looks real nice and he's been to school and he's got a Bible in his hand and he stands up and he claims to be preaching the Bible, but it's evil communication because it's contrary to what the Bible says. And evil communication of that type is worse than somebody trying to hook you up with heroin or cocaine or a prostitute. God says about the Pharisees that were misguiding people by their vain jangling and by their false doctrine that he made people a twofold child of hell and there was a greater damnation restored for them. They were going to hell anyway, but the Lord said, because you're teaching false doctrine, I got something greater in damnation for you than Hitler gets or Bloody Mary gets or Goebbels gets or Stalin or any of the other ones that get. They get that because they're teaching you something false. The value of a man's soul is more important than the value of whether or not he does something wrong with his body. 
You need to understand, if I could be so dogmatic as to say, that somebody that is always worried about how you're dressed and, and how you're looking and whether or not you're married to the right one or married to the wrong one and whether or not you read your Bible study, pray and all this stuff. The Bible says, I'm supposed to watch for your soul, not your flesh. Now, I know that irritates the stew out of some people because they want everybody to be in the same bondage you're under. And so you want me to tell everybody that you think they ought to be like you because you got a problem thinking that you're the poster child for what a Christian man or a woman ought to look like. Amen. Good preaching. If you're not saying nothing, throw the ball back. It'll go a lot faster tonight. What you have to understand is that's vain jangling, that's vain talking. You know what it appeals to? You bunch of Pharisees that are saying, oh yes, our church is a church where you have to have a coat and tie on Sunday and our church doesn't like it if you have tats and our church doesn't like it if you got uh, earrings in your nose or your ears or you happen to have them other places that I don't want to know about. Uh, our, our church is one of those churches where, you know, no, no, uh-uh, no, doctrinally straight. On the outside, we're messed up as a soup sandwich, just a bunch of sinners saved by grace. And if you would spend more time working on your relationship with God instead of judging what everybody else is doing, you might actually grow some as a Christian. Amen. Evil communication to corrupt good manners. You using Facebook and all your social media to pimp out everybody that's not doing what you think they ought to do. Or here's a good one, to broadcast what they have done. You know what that Bible said? That Bible says even forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You holding a grudge against somebody? You can't let it go? Well, he lets yours go. Why can't you let it go? Well, do you know what they did to me? Can't you let it go? Do you know what you did to him? He went to the cross because of me and you. Vain jangling, uh, that's, that's talking, that will increase, the Bible says, to more ungodliness. You say, what, in a church? Yeah, in a church with a Bible and a pulpit. 2 Corinthians 11, his ministers are ministers of righteousness and no marvel for the devil himself appears an angel of light. If you didn't have a Bible, you wouldn't know the devil if he showed up. You say, why, well, he looked just like Jesus. Now, I'm going to try to give you a warning today, but I'm going to try to tell you, for you people, you're not worried so much about a politician, maybe some of you are, about a politician pulling the wool over your eyes. What you got to be careful for is a preacher pulling the wool over your eyes giving you some doctrinal foolishness like, you know, uh, you got to have something other than salvation by grace through faith. you got to have baptism or you got to have the Lord's Supper or you have to have the Eucharist, that little bunch of flour turned into the body of Christ and the, the hoots turned into blood. you got to have something extra. you got to live it. you got to do it. you got to write a commentary that says James is an epistle for the church today that proves that if you're saved, these works will follow you. My foot, those works may not ever follow you. Vain jangling. You say, what will that do? It will make a bunch of Pharisees out of you who are doing those things and thinking, well, I'm a good Christian and I'm living this way and other people aren't living that way. I'm saved. They must be lost. You try to talk people out of their salvation. Salvation is between them and God. It has nothing to do with you. I bet you there's times in your life where if you really looked in the mirror and you really did an honest evaluation of yourself, you'd look at yourself and say, there's no way I can be saved. If you're honest, if you're honest, if you're honest. I bet you're doing some things right now that if you were to put them up in front of a bunch of these uh, preachers, you know what they'd say to you? Well, you can't be saved and do that. You must be lost. No, I'm just out of fellowship, that's all. No, you're lost. No, I'm not. I'm saved as I can be. I'm just out of fellowship with the Lord. Well, no, you can't be. You say, why? You're my judge? You ain't my judge. You might catch me in a pair of jeans and a t-shirt tomorrow and run off the deep end and be down somewhere. You say, well, the preacher must not have ever been saved. No, I've been saved. Maybe I just got tired of the brethren. <coughs> Maybe I just wanted to irritate people. I don't know. I, I can't tell you what I'm going to be tomorrow. I'm going to do my best to do the best I possibly can as with, with God's help and by God's grace I will. But ladies and gentlemen, if you ever sell yourself to think that you're the poster child for what Christianity is, be careful because if you're not humble, you're going to stumble. Amen. Now let me show you this thing in 2 Timothy. You say, what are you doing? I'm warning you about preachers. I'm warning you about preachers who, can I just say this, get you caught up in politics that has nothing to do with anywhere else in the entire world and will not help you in your fellowship with Jesus Christ. And I don't care. I'll just, well, I'm not going to tell you his name, but you know what he said? He said, I believe at the judgment seat of Christ, you'll be held accountable for who you voted for. 
chapter and verse, you braying donkey, you. Amen. How are you going to preach that anywhere else that doesn't even, isn't even allowed to vote? You can't preach that in the Philippines. You can't preach it in India and Africa and Romania. And that you're going to be held accountable. You trying to make me vote? Why? Because you're worried about what's going to happen to you? So, preacher, do you know not to be all upset about it? I should be upset about it. This is God's pulpit. It has nothing to do with man. Amen. You should be able to preach whatever you preach here. You ought to be able to preach it anywhere in the entire world. If not, it ain't God. It's just your agenda. And that's what happened. You replaced the book with your brains. And there ain't much of it. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. You sound mighty arrogant. I'm preaching for him. Amen. I know what I'm talking about. You say, why? I've seen entire congregations. You know what that Bible says? The Bible said they subvert whole houses. I've seen entire households by one or two matriarchs run off the tracks and split churches down the middle claiming that they had the Bible on their side. And you just happen to be here today when we're talking about it. You probably have been a part of churches that have been the same way. They all claim to have Bible for what they're doing. They ain't got Bible for rightly dividing. The Bible told you that was what was going to happen. Subvert whole houses. You see, what do they do? Well, they don't start it in the church. They start coming to your house first and have a little fellowship, have a little Bible study, and have a little get-together and have a little talk and, and get to know each other. Well, you know, the preacher, he, he don't cover these things, but I'll, I'll cover the things he dares not to tread into. And I, I'll tell you what we can do. Now we'll have us a little get-together and have a little fun. And next thing you know, the women are having a busy bee party. You know what the Bible says about that, ma'am? You should. The Bible said because their hands are idle, you know what they do? They become busybodies in other men's matters. And the next thing you know, that Bible study has got your preacher and his family in the crosshairs and now you're talking about his wife and you're talking about his kids and you're talking about this and you're talking about that and before long that stuff creeps into the church and whoosh, there she goes right down the middle. You say, how do you fix it? You don't listen to it. They come to you with that stuff. You know what you say? Hey, let's, let's go get the preacher. Yeah. 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 Why would you want to do that? He doesn't control my life. I know, but you're going to talk about him, so let's just... <laughs> You'd want somebody to do that for you, right? 2 Timothy chapter number 2, you know the verse, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a work needeth not to be ashamed, right? To abide in the word of truth. But, oops, shun profane and... Vain babblings, no value to them at all. Vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Now before you think he's talking about pornography and cussing and telling dirty jokes and all that, which is where most people go, look at the next two verses. It has nothing to do with worldly things. It has to do with two guys that are teaching their resurrection has already taken place. Amillennialism. False doctrine. He just said it's vain babbling and it increases to more ungodliness. You mean false doctrine increases ungodliness? It's what he said. You say, what am I supposed to do? Paul said their mouths must be stopped. Now come back, if you will, please, to the book of Titus. He said, well, preacher, that just seems pretty hard. Yeah, but if you understand that going in, you understand it's protection. Listen, you don't have to explain to your kids all about the big bad wolf. You don't have to explain to them why they need to follow that little sense inside them, that little voice inside them that when a creeper comes along and, you know, would you like some candy, little girl? And Can you help me find my puppy? And something gets twisted up in there and their, their butterflies ain't flying in formation, as Brother Jerry used to say, and things aren't going right. You don't try to explain to them why that's dangerous. You know what you say? Scream. You say, but what if they're falsely accusing? He ought to know better than to be asking a little girl without parents around, do you want some candy or help me find my puppy? Right. Ah! What are you screaming for? You're a creeper. Get out of my face. No, I, I really have lost my puppy. Then ask an adult. See, some of you creepers are bothering you right now. You're kind of like, oh, I, don't, I don't really think that kids ought to be, uh-uh, uh-uh. We don't do that. You don't have your kid come up and never have met me, don't know nothing about me except from the pulpit and expect your kid to feel the same way about me that you do. You say, who is that? That's an adult man. Be careful about any of them. Who's that? That's the preacher. They have to get to know me. 
And even when they do, there ain't going to be no hugs and kisses. You say, why? Teach them wrong habits. That's for daddy and papa and granddaddy. Oops. That ain't a, for a Sunday school teacher. If it's a female Sunday school teacher, one thing, but even be careful with the little boys. I hope you're getting nervous. See, what do you know about it? I, I do know a little bit about it, not to taunt my history, but I've had a few years of experience with that, and you ain't going to have me back off of that at all. I got a call from out west yesterday. He said, Preacher, I got a guy who wants to come to my church. He's been accused of pedophilia. Uh, he's wanting to come to church, and he swears up and down he's innocent and didn't that the other. I'd just like to know what you do. I said, that guy wouldn't be in within 500 miles of my church. He said, well, you know, he hadn't been to court yet. I said, I don't care. I said, buddy, where there's smoke, well, you know, sometimes there's people that are falling. I said, hey, man, are you, are you one of them? I said, you think I'd take a chance with that? I said, no, no. Tell him that, you know, uh-uh, uh-uh. He ain't coming. You say, why? It ain't worth the risk. Amen. That's on him. That ain't my fault. That's his fault. You messed up? Too bad. That's one you don't get by with. Well, I did my time. You doing your time for the rest of your life, you're going to get a life sentence as far as I'm concerned. You go somewhere else. Amen. That's church policy. Amen. <laughs> you can't dictate. Try me. I'd be wondering why you were defending one of them anyway. It might be you should be right on their heels. There are certain things you'd be dogmatic about. You say, why? I got a bunch of kids to look out for whether you do or not. I'm not running the risk. You say, well, just keep an eye on them. We ain't got the manpower to follow you around like you're a little old lost puppy. All it takes is one minute to take their eyes off you and you in a bathroom with some boy you ain't supposed to be in there with, and we got a problem. Mm-mm, mm-mm. We got plenty of speed bumps. We don't need another one. Well, you're a preacher, that's why people don't come to this church. Sometimes it's good that those people don't come to this church. Well, they just don't feel welcome. Have them over to your house. Oh, you wouldn't? Well, then why should I have them in God's house? Well, they've been forgiven. Praise the Lord. See you in heaven when He can fix it. Till then, I'm just going to assume you're going to mess up. And they will. <laughs> Titus chapter 3. The Bible said they subvert whole houses. Paul says about that this. Verse number 9, avoid foolish questions. And let me just say to y'all, y'all don't ask foolish questions during Q&A, and I appreciate it. He said, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they're unprofitable and vain, vain jangling. People ask questions for three reasons. They really want to know the answer. They want to show you what they know. Or they want to see how much you know. You know what he said? He said there are certain individuals that ask biblical questions. They're vain. They're of no value whatsoever. How many angels can dance on the head of a pen? How many demons can jump in a person? I don't know. The legion was in one, but that don't mean he was full. Maybe we're in for one more. I don't know. You tell me. I don't know. The Bible says, and a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition do what? Yeah. Why don't argue with him? Vain jangling. You keep listening to them, you can start alibying them. They'll start convincing you. They'll start swaying you. They'll start turning you. They'll start where you get the feeling, well, I don't know, maybe they got a point now. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such, uh-oh, he's got a problem. Yeah. He's subverted if the Bible's right. If he's not on the doctrinal page you're on, you know what the Bible, this is the Bible. You're reading the Bible, right? right. Sinning against himself. Right. He's not accepting those basic doctrines because he's got a heart problem. The Lord says, save your breath. The reason I've cut him off from any further knowledge is, is because he's got a sin that you don't know about. But I'm telling you, the reason that he's doing that is because he's sinning against himself. Now, does that tell you anything? 
when it comes to doctrinal issues and somebody refuses to move on those doctrinal issues and they're dogmatic about it and you try to show them what the Bible says a couple of times and they don't get it, if the Bible's right, the Bible says the problem's them, they got a heart problem. Well, preacher, I, you know, I, they're really nice. I just, I don't believe they really got a heart problem. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, God, when he wrote that through the Holy Spirit, he's lying. They're not sinners. They don't have a problem. God didn't blind them to the truth of things because he, he just, he's just making it hard for them. You're mighty quiet. The Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, told Titus, hey, don't argue with them people because number one, it's going to be a waste of your time. Number two, you can't see. They got a problem you can't see. Leave them alone. Let God deal with them. All right, come down, if you will, please, to verse number 12, chapter number 1. One of their own says, now this is one of their own people, a Cretan. You're going to talk about how it is. I'll just give you these things, and I'll try to get you out of here in about maybe 15 minutes. I'm going to try. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts and slow bellies. And you say, well, that doesn't take much uh, uh, description, I guess, or definition. You certainly know what evil beasts are and, and what liars are. Murderers, rapers, robbers, those kind of things. Cannibalists, uh, cannibalism, uh, taking advantage of people. As their slow bellies is, is they're just fat and lazy. That's what a slow belly is. Just somebody who's just a glutton and doesn't do anything. Just, just gluttonous, eating all the time. I'm talking about your girth now. I understand that. I, I don't, don't get all mad about it. That's what he calls him. That's what a slow belly is. It's an individual that has no control over what they put in their mouth. They just live for themselves. That's an evil beast. They just take advantage of other people. Liars. That's what that is. Now he goes on to say, and this is them. This isn't Paul talking. The witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Rebuke who sharply? Lost people? No, it's people that have now been saved who are still living like they used to live. He said, rebuke them sharply. Why? That they may be sound in the faith. Meaning they're in the faith, but he's saying, you got to tell them, you need to correct those behaviors and you need to quit. You can't just live the way you want to live and call yourself a Christian. You can be saved, but he said, rebuke them, get on to them, straighten them out. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about going down to the unsaved Christians and straighten out unsaved people. What's the point of preaching to people that are unsaved and talking about their lifestyle? They don't have any way of changing. They don't even know they're doing anything wrong. In a minute, he's going to say, unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto the, un the people that are lost, there's nothing pure. You say, why? They got no conscience about anything. They do whatever they want to do whenever they want to do it. When you get saved, you not only have the benefit of a conscience, but you get the benefit of the Holy Spirit to give you warnings where you never had warnings before because you can practice wrong behavior long enough that your conscience gets seared to the point that it don't even bother. You don't even think nothing of it. You don't even give it a second thought. But once you get saved, the Lord shines a light on and says, Hey, what you doing, man? Lord, I'm doing what I always did. Well, it ain't right. You know better than to do that. That's what he's talking about there. When he says unto the pure, all things are pure, he's not saying that means you can make pure out of manure, or you can make pure out of smoking, pure out of drinking, pure out of that. No, I'm going to show you the verses that even if it wasn't a sin for you to commit, you're not entitled to just commit it. You have to think of others now. Even if it was lawful for you to eat meat, the Lord says to you through the Bible in Corinthians, even if it's lawful and it causes your brother to stumble, don't eat the meat. And you talk about a double whammy. It's not just a matter of whether or not you're under... Well, that just don't convict me. Does it make your family fall? Does it make your friends fall? Does it make other believers fall? Well, yeah, but, but, it, but it don't convict me. The Lord said, yeah, but it may bother them, so don't do it for their sake. Let me show you a few verses on that. You say, what do you mean? I got to live my life uh, for other people? Yeah, that's exactly right. What people try to do is put a list of rules and regulations on you that you'll find. And then he comes in there and he says, listen, you're not under the rules and regulations, but you're no longer living your life. Come to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You're not living your life just for yourself anymore. You're living it for the benefit of others. Christians have a hard time understanding that now that you're saved, it's not a license to sin. I believe in eternal security, but I do not believe that just because you're saved that you will not sin and that just because you're saved that you can do whatever you want to. 
I believe that you ought to live as clean a life as you possibly can live, not to prove you're saved, but to be a good example and a good witness and a good testimony for Jesus Christ, but also to keep your brother from stumbling. Now, the context of what we're talking about is it has nothing to do so far with doing things of the flesh. He's talking about doctrinal matters. Oops. You mean the right Bible? Yeah. Yeah, I mean the right Bible. I mean King James Bible. Well, you know, they got the Living Bible and they got the New American Standard and they got the... They got, yeah, I, I know, I know. You don't condone them their conscience by saying, well, it's, all, it's just a Bible. don't really matter, do you? You mean the right church? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. Amen. Yeah, I can't just go anywhere. Amen. Well, but preacher, no, no, I, I can't. You say, why? I, I might be able to tolerate it. I might be able to get it and have no problem with it and walk out, no problem. But what's it going to do when other people see me at that church? What's it going to be when I sit down with the interfaith council and there's all kind of people that are, don't believe what I believe about tongues and healings and signs and wonders and miracles and offerings and all that other kind of and prosperity? What's you going to think when you see me sitting there? You say, preacher, it probably wouldn't affect you at all. No, but would it affect you by me being associated with them? That's the Christian life. You say, what does it mean? It means who I'm affiliated with matters. Amen. First Corinthians chapter number 6. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 12. Paul says this, All things are lawful to me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I'll not be brought under the power of any. Uh, I'm not controlled by, uh, by cigarettes or liquor. You say, why? Because it's a bad testimony. Well, preacher, everybody has, you know, the little ups and downs. Yeah, but why aren't you trying to quit? How about your mouth? See, it's easy to see this or this. How about what comes out? How about that rudder that can control a ship and you can't control the tongue that sets the fires of hell? How about that? How about the slander? How about the gossip? You're not going to be brought under the power of any, right? Maybe some things that we could work on a little bit. I don't know what you think. 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. Paul talking to the most carnal church there was. Verse number 10, 8, 10, 9. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee, which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? And when ye sin so against the brethren, wound their weak conscience. Oops. You reading the rest of the passage? You sin against who? Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest my brother to be offended. That's pretty bold. Preacher, anything going on going to a ball game on Sunday? I don't know. You want to go, go, but going to call your brother to stumble? Well, it's not my, uh, not my job. I'm not my brother's keeper. You sure about that? You sure about that? How about a preacher that will stand up and tell you to violate the law like one down south of here that told you to violate curfews that were put out by the legal officials and tell you in the name of God you should violate that on January the 1st for New Year's Eve because nobody has a right to tell you for a curfew. How's that jail with Romans 13? Well, how about you lead the charge, bud? How about before you order me to do it, how about you go down and do it? Use your authority as a pastor to tell me to violate it and I wind up in jail? You say, what would you do? Well, there's a difference in me and you. Not only would I not do it, I would never darken the doors of that church. I wouldn't even preach with a guy like that. Not knowingly. You say, why? Because it looks like I'm signing off on insurrection. I don't believe in that. Well, there are certain things, you know, preacher, you know, you got to stand up for them guns. They going to come get them. Well, what you planning on doing with it? Well, you know, preacher, when all of us good uns give up the guns, only the bad ones will have them. Well, good. I guess we get home to heaven quicker. What you going to do with them? You got plans to commit some kind of crime or something? It's protection, is it? 
Well, boy, lest I diver, die by, lest I digress, I guess we better move on. You're the only country in the entire world that has that liberty. And I'm all for you having it. I hope you know how to do it. And I hope you got the guts to do it if you have to. If not, they'll take it away from you and use it on you. Every time you're in an argument or a fight, you're, there's, a, there's a gun now there. Somebody's going to get it. You sure you're ready for that? You want that on your conscience? You think that's an easy thing to live with? I'm just saying a lot of preachers are putting a lot of pressure on you with their personal and their political and their prejudicial agenda. And it ain't Bible. They're using the Bible to twist it into what they want it to be. First Corinthians 10, verse 23. Paul says again, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Just dump in the interest of time. Verse 29. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but the, of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if by grace I be partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Whether ye therefore eat, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense neither to Jew or Gentile nor to the church of God. Even as I pleased all men in all things, not seeking mine own, but profit many. You know what Paul just said to you right there? Paul said, listen, you can, but you can't. Romans chapter 14, just give you a few of these. These individuals that I'm talking about, you'll find out by the time we get to 16 and we may not get there to it or not, they profess they know God. It doesn't mean anything. How many of you know about Edi Amin? Anybody? Do you know he professed to know God? He professed to be doing God's will. Do you know how many millions of people he enslaved and killed? How many of you have heard about a man by the name of Adolf Hitler? Anybody here know who that is? He professed to know God. He's a Roman Catholic. How many of you know that there have been millions of Christians been put to death by popes? They profess to know God. That don't mean nothing. I know God. God told me. You get into that God complex where God told me this and God told me that and God told me I was going to have this and God told me I was going to get that and God told me this. Really? Boy, you are literally one step away from God told me to take my son to the mountaintop and offer him for a, a sacrifice. That's Koresh. That's uh, Guyana. That's uh, Jim Jones. Yeah. Revelation from God. Scripture? That's right. That's right. Yeah, they profess to know God. Not the God of the book. Amen. God's not going to violate His book. You know what that book says? That book says if you don't work, you don't eat. What makes you think you're going to walk out and there'll be a Cadillac parked in your driveway and somebody hand you the keys to a new house? You say, what? He violates Scripture if he does it. Paul said, you know what he said? You know what Paul said about it? Surely you know. Second Thessalonians, you know what he said? He said, we have us for an example. And if anybody doesn't work, don't eat, don't fellowship with them. He doesn't even say for you to feed them. You say, why? Because they ain't working. You working, ladies and gentlemen, was never intended for you to pay for people who can work and don't. It was to take people, care of people who can't work and want to, but you got to help them take care of them. That's why you work. It wasn't working to take care of people that can work. Amen. But you violate Scripture in the name of Jesus. Romans 14, uh, hurry, 14. Paul says this, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing in, unclean in of itself, of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Come down to 23. And if he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, or whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You know what he just said to you? If it's unclean to them, don't participate in it. Let me give you another one. Come to 1 Timothy uh, 4. I'm trying to hurry. I know I told you 15 minutes, but this is important. You say, well, preacher, they profess to know God. 
That's the worst enemy there is. The people that claim to know God. Well, they're good people, preacher. Really? Really, they're good people? By, by what definition are they good? Because they don't murder and rape and rob? What, by what definition are the people good? Are they Bible believers? Well, we don't have it all right either, preacher. No, but we got the doctrines right. Why are you so afraid to stand on that? You're, you wouldn't be affiliated with certain people that would cost you money. You wouldn't give your money to a, 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 a bad organization that's supporting some. Why would you support somebody by your presence and by signing off on it by just not saying anything? Why well, you're an enabler when you do that. You say, well, yeah, but I'll be cantankerous and all that. At least they'll know where you stand. Do they even know where you stand? I think we live in a kind of days nowadays, it's kind of just, well, I, you know, preacher, I just, you know, I just want to get through this life with unscathed if I can. I don't even know how you can live a day without at some point in time have what you believe tested. I'm still on the don't watch news thing. You can probably tell because I hadn't been preaching ripped from the headlines. Here's a great news story for you. I did hear this. I heard it today. They shipped the president's dogs out of the White House because they bit people. Uh, okay. And that's news out of our country that went around the world. <laughs> hey, China, we got rabid dogs in the White House. We had to ship them. They're like, we eat them over here. <laughs> got a dog bite you? There's dinner. <laughs> I heard that today and I'm like, how does that, how does that make a news cycle. That's why I don't listen to the news. You say, what? It, you can't listen to it without going, that ain't right. You say, but preacher, how will you be informed? Well, I haven't been informed since November. You being informed, where has it gotten you compared to me? I bet you I'm sleeping better than you. With the exception of the last couple of weeks because of some things that were going on. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't worry about his dogs being shipped to my front door. What are they, Cocker Spaniels or something? I'm trying to set you up. <laughs> Y'all are like, you know what they are, they're German Shepherds. Oh, you've been watching that, have you? <laughs> Y'all are like, you're hoping some visitor goes, German Shepherds, like... First Timothy 4, verse 1. Almost done. We're going to land here in a second. When you put these individuals to the real motive test, you know what you'll find out? They'll fail every time. Verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly in the latter times. Some shall depart from the faith, those saved people, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving to them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be, if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now you take your Bible with that and think of this. Come to 2 Timothy and look quickly at chapter number 4. 
The progression goes to 1 Timothy chapter 3 in the perilous times. We've already talked about it. By the time you're in 2 Timothy 4, he gives Titus this. He says, preach the word. Preach the word. What's he telling you? Don't preach the vain jangling. Don't preach the vain things. Don't preach the dietary laws. Don't preach the medical foolishness. Don't preach the headlines. Preach the words. Preach the word, he says. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and be turned away from the truth unto... How about that? The very thing he's warning you about. You say, what's a fable? It ain't just Aesop's fables. It's somebody making the Bible fit their agenda and then feeding it to you and calling it sheep food and using you like merchandise for their agenda or for their opportunity to get a bunch of hits on YouTube. And you know what the Lord said? One of the signs that you know, Titus, you're moving toward the end is when all of a sudden God's pulpit's used for something other than God's words. And you've got a problem. Father, I pray you bless your word. And thank you for these folks coming out, especially on a Wednesday night with so much stuff that's going on and so many things happening. I pray, God, you'll bless them for their willingness to come. Thank you for the visitors coming. Thank you for the preachers being here that came from uh, all over the creation. Thank you, Lord, also for the folks coming from North Carolina. I pray, Heavenly Father, now that you might bless this evening, bless these folks, give them safe passage back home. Uh, continue to be with those that have lost loved ones, especially the Monroe family, as they sort through the losses that they've had and bring us back together, we pray, on Sunday. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.